How are you? Good. How are you? I'm okay. Um, so I just have some questions about things that I'm having a hard time accepting within Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. So what is the questions that you have? Go ahead. Um, well, my first question is, can I still be a Muslim if I agree with the core theology? Like I agree in, I agree with that there's a creator and that there's prophets, but some of the things um, I disagree with some of the leadings or ideas in Islam, like um, some of the things that the prophets say, like I don't completely agree with those. And no, if you disagree with any part of the, the, the Quran and you say you don't believe in that thing or you disagree with it, you think is wrong, it's, it's not up to the times, it's not up to the standards, it's not just, it's not fair, uh, or the Prophet ﷺ was wrong about this specific thing, you can this is, this would disqualify the person from being a Muslim. Okay. A, a, a Muslim, the definition of the word means submitter, someone who submits to the revelation. Okay. He submits to Allah, he submits to the messenger and the teachings of Allah and his messenger. Basically. It's the definition of what the word Muslim means. Okay, so there's a couple other questions that I have or that like just don't completely make sense to me. But um, one of them is that there is... So in the, in the chapter of Muhammad, um, it talks a lot about how disbelievers' good, good deeds get dismissed on judgment day. But my question is disbelievers can still be good people so why do their good deeds get dismissed yeah good deeds are dismissed on the day of judgment not dismissed in this world so they can get something for uh, what they do in this world allah says he were, he gives them uh, in return of what they do in this world because what they did was for this world those okay. people you can you can use the term good people we, we wouldn't agree with that terminology by the way they can do good things that does not mean they're good people there's a difference between the two. But when you say those people have still done something good, let's assume, for example, they give charity. Mm -hmm. What is the intention they have when they're giving charity? Well, there can be a variety of intentions. Go ahead. Give me. They're not believers. So what kind of intentions they have? Uh, they, uh, I... So they could be giving charity because uh, they agree with the cause or they feel empathy for the people who need the money. Like there's a there's a couple different reasons as to yeah. why they could. And there are many selfish reasons as well. For example, they want yes. to uh, uh, they want to feel good because when you do that, you feel good. When you you get when you do give others, you you feel good yourself. Uh, they can be doing it so people can praise them and say, "Oh, look, this person is a charitable person. Look at all the good that he's doing." But all of these uh, intentions that you mentioned is any of them for the sake of God? Um, not not the ones that I mentioned. No. Or or any because they don't believe in God to begin with, so they will never have an intention to do with God. Mm -hmm. So why should they expect God to reward them? Why should God reward people who didn't do anything for him? You still with me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You're like, thinking it's a about fair it, yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing. Look, if, if you didn't do it for Allah, then there's no point of Allah. Why would Allah reward you for it? You did it for this life. You did it for your own self. And Allah li lives you in this life. He gives you provision. He lets you live. He shows mercy on you. But when the time comes in, in, in the day of judgment, that creator that you don't believe in, you cannot come complain of how he's treating you because you didn't even give him any, any care. You didn't even care that he exists. You ignored him. You ignored all of his commands. You pretended as if he's not even there. So you deserve what you get. Okay. Okay. Um, another one is I have a question about the day of judgment. Um, so the day of judgment is described as like on that day everyone will be so fearful and focused on themselves that they won't even be able to recognize their own mother their own children etc um so as someone who is a mother like i have a little baby um in a time where i am so scared why would i not protect my children who are also scared why would i leave them to fend for myself yeah it's not just about the idea of, of protection the, the, the verse is not necessarily talking about protection only and it's not just the fear it's the shock mm -hmm. uh, there's a shock factor in which then the immense amount of the shock removes everything it keeps your mind blank mm -hmm. and we can go back a few minutes for example when you were thinking about the answer that i gave you you mm -hmm. stayed blank for a minute there so that was the only thing in your mind mm -hmm. there's nothing else in your mind so when you get a, a shock of seeing, for example, angels, seeing hellfire and heaven, seeing things which in which are we would refer to as supernatural from today's perspective, you cannot even you there is no no one else in your mind at that time. Mm -hmm. it's just you. And if you see hellfire and the descriptions of hellfire or description uh, of the punishment there, you you it's impossible for you to try to think about anything else because that occupies your complete mind of where you're gonna end up yourself. Mm -hmm.
I have another question. It's I know a lot of people when they join is or when they when they become Muslim, a lot of them will pick an Islamic name. But if your name isn't like if your born name isn't anti-Islamic, is it still necessary to pick an no. Islam name? No, you're welcome to keep your name. And and, and the, there is a lot of people who tell people, oh, change your name. This, you shouldn't. Look, as long as your name is okay, I, I actually recommend that people keep their name. This is how people know them. This is how people uh, speak to them. This is what they've been used to. Unless their name has a problematic connotation, like the servant or the, the worshiper of Christ, for example, something like this, which exists in Arabic, for example. Some people have this name. So then, okay, then there you have to change your name because you don't worship human beings. So uh, unless this is the case, even if it was the worshiper of Muhammad, peace be upon them, we'd still ask you to change the name because that name is incorrect Islamically and, and is worshiping other than Allah. So it all depends on on uh, on the name. If, if the name is okay, it has a good meaning, like a name of the flower or or a good name of something good, basic, good characteristic. Then there's no no need for the person to change the name. Um, and another one, and I'm sure you've talked about this one before. Sometimes it seems like Islam can be a little bit oppressive towards women. Um, so for example, when we aren't allowed to be seen by men, we aren't allowed to talk to men, we aren't allowed to travel alone outside of our house unless we have permission or a guardian why why are things like that put in place only for women okay uh, let me just ask first one question because you said islam is uh, like uh, oppressive to women and then you give a few examples you said talk to men which obviously islam doesn't say talk to men is is, is haram for example right like non uh, non ma 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 har mahram yes so yeah. excellent. So now you are saying it's a specific type of men. So you, you should not be then uh, generalizing it to everyone. So if it's a specific type of men, there must be a reason. Okay, what is a non-mahram in the Islamic perspective? A non-mahram is in the Islamic perspective, someone you can marry. That means that there is sexual tension that can, it can exist between you and the individual. Sexual attraction, all of these things can exist between you and the individual. So uh, limiting the contact between these two individuals, because that person has a specific category. But for example, me speaking to my brother, my my, my father, or or uh, something like this, or my grandfather, these are all men still, and I'm allowed to speak to them. This idea mm -hmm. doesn't exist, and even the woman can dress, or she can have her hair, she can have uh, uh, out when she's speaking to her family members, male or non-male. So when you say, but you made the term, you said oppress, oppressive. So, so uh, can you define what is oppression? So to me, the idea of oppressive uh, oppression is when someone is limited in what they are and aren't allowed to do. Okay, but that is not the definition for, for oppression. Okay. Oppression is yeah, oppression is unjust treatment. Okay. Uh, so so this is limitations is what you're referring to. Yeah. So if but then you're oppressed by by the country you're living in then because there's so many things you cannot do there. So all of the Western women are oppressed then because Western Western women cannot uh, you know drink and drive for example they're all oppressed okay you get what i'm trying to say so if we if we use the term oppression there then you have to say that all western women are oppressed wherever you live wherever you are there has to be certain limitations to the things that you can do and the things that you cannot do. do you agree with me on this okay okay now when it comes to the islamic rules depends on the rule that you ask there is a reason and i give you an example you talked about for example being uh, uh, around non mohammed i explained to you the idea that these are two genders that will be attracted to one another Prophet ﷺ, he said, when you're alone with a woman, the third person is Satan. So Satan tries to beautify the woman for the man, and also the woman in her heart sways for the man is vice versa. It happens with both of them. When, when you talk about travel, travel is, a, is, a, is when a woman will become in a place when she's alone. She doesn't have any protection. She doesn't have any it's long distances. She'd be tired. She'll have most likely to sleep alone uh, in, in a hotel or in a place. She needs protection. She needs someone to look after her, and she might need help in wherever she goes. So there, there is a lot of reasons I can give you, but the main thing, it's not these reasons, is the creator commanded it. He knows the nature of a man, he knows the nature of a woman, and he knows what is beneficial for both parties. And people who are following these commands, they're following it because Allah commanded it. So none of them believe this is unjust treatment. They believe this is, when Muslim women follow these commands, they know this is from God, and they know that it's just. And most of them actually know the reason behind it. But they still, many people, they still just want to follow their desires. But the thing is, you said, why not men? This is what you said, which is a very okay. feministic way to think about it, which is natural for someone who lives in, in the West to be influenced by Western ideologies and Western ideas. But the question is, is the man the same as a woman? No. Okay, so if we are different psychologically, physically, and in every uh, way, literally almost, even in the way that we think or perceive ideas or the way that we express ourselves, if we are different in all of these different aspects, 
then it would not make any sense for the treatment to be the same for a man and a woman. There has to be differences in the treatment because they're not the same. They're different. So when Allah, uh, what men, for example, are attracted to in women is number one is the physical looks of a woman. This is how men are created. And there are studies on this. This is the first thing that they're attracted to. But for a woman is not the, the case. It's not what they put as number one on the list of their attraction when it comes to the man. So uh, then uh, what a, man, a woman, how a woman can dress would be different from how a man can dress because the attraction is not the same. It's not symmetrical. They would not attract you to the same things. So because we're different, the commands of Allah Azza wa will be different. It will be optimal for the situation of the man and situation of the woman. So whatever command that is there for a man that is not for a woman, it is because it befits her nature as a woman. And it is the best command or, or option or situation that she can be in. And the same for a man. Like when Allah says to the man, you have to go. And, and no one complains about that. It's just, you know, man, you have to go. A work, you have to provide for your woman. You have to provide housing and clothing and everything for her. She doesn't need to participate when it comes to the financial aspects of, of the relationship. This is your responsibility. You have to protect her. If any if any danger, you're responsible for her. You are a shepherd and you will be responsible for your flock. So if any danger takes place, you are the one responsible. You need to protect even if you're going to lose your life in that fight. So these are things that Allah commands the man. And you don't see the man coming complaining. Oh, why did Allah? This is oppressive. No one says that. We accept, okay, Allah Allah told me I have to work. My life is going to be more difficult, you know. No one is going to come give me, uh, you know, mahr, marital gift, you know, and then, and then pay my rent and pay my food. No one is going to do that for me as a man. I have to go and work. And because I'm a man, this is these are the commands that I need to keep up with. Therefore, I follow because of my, I know this is what works for me as a man. Allah knows my nature. Allah knows the best option for me and what I should be doing and what I should be doing. Okay, that makes sense. But I guess it's just more like evident as to how the women are treated differently. But um, I have another okay. question. No, no, I can't let you, I can't let you move on there, right? Because like you made a comment there. So so can you tell me evident where, which, which place? Like I'm just, um, and maybe it's because like I'm a girl, but I don't see as much men having to follow specific like rules or guidance or things like that um okay have you have you been no no but you said how women are treated you didn't, you didn't say it about men but have you been to a muslim country no okay so how is it evident when you've not even been to one country i just mean see? i just mean yeah. like from what i've learned um in islam like for example they're they're allowed to go out alone they don't need a guardian to travel like stuff like that like um Are, okay let me ask you this question uh when it comes to physicality if i bring a 20 year old woman and a 15 year old boy and they fight who's gonna win i i don't generally, know <laughs> generally in most cases who's gonna win i guess the guy okay why is he going to win? Because he's got a, a, a physical nature that is God-given that the woman does not have. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a muscle mass, more muscle mass, faster reaction uh, speed, uh, tissues, muscle tissues, and all of these things. So if they're not the same when it comes to the physicality and power and who can, uh, can overcome the other, then one can be allowed to go out nighttime where he is able to protect himself and one would not be. Does not, doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, also... I had a question about why why are men allowed to marry within other religions, but women are not? Uh, the simple reason Allah Azzawajal said so. He allowed it, therefore it's allowed. That's it. Okay. But it's not other religions. It's only Judaism and Christianity. The Judaism and Christianity. Yeah, yeah. So if a woman is, is a Hindu or a woman is, an, is, is not a believer, is an atheist, or any type of polytheist, a uh, fire worshiper, a multiple god worshiper, any of these different things, you know, worship stars, and uh, still, he's not allowed to marry her. But, but the Jews and the Christ, uh, Christian women, uh, first, uh, as I said, first, the main and imp most important reason is Allah, Allah Azza wa commanded it. Now, what wisdom some people, some scholars have spoken about, for example, the fact that we are very close to the Christian and Jewish women in their, uh, in their beliefs. So we believe in the same prophets, most of the same prophets we believe in. We believe in the hellfire and, and heaven. Mm -hmm. The commands, most of them are, are similar. They have mm -hmm. the commonalities between the prophets and all of these different things. So it's very easy for, for a woman, uh, if she lives with a Muslim man, to accept Islam, to become a Muslim in the future. That's a very easy thing because there's already very a lot of commonalities between you and that woman. But even though this is the case, Allah Azza wa has still put conditions. He said the woman has to be chaste, which means she's, she's either a virgin or she doesn't sleep around with men. Mm -hmm. And 90, 99% of the women in the West today, they, they're every day with a, with a different man, you know? And obviously I'm exaggerating when I say it a different day, but you know what I mean. They're always here and there. So if mm -hmm. this is the case, they don't fit the criteria of what Islam allows anyways. So the, okay. if a woman is like this, she commits fornication uh, and she does it and she, she continuously does it. This woman is not permissible for a Muslim man because Allah has put that she has to be chaste. And the second thing, she has to believe in her religion, her book, that her book is from God. So there's a lot of cultural Christian women that claim that, you know what, 
I'm Christian, but I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, I don't go to the church. But what do you mean by Christian? They have baptism sometime when they were like two or three, you know? So that does not mean Christian from an Islamic perspective. So when Allah allows Jew or Christian, these two conditions still apply. And as I said, the wisdoms of scholars have said, is this idea is much easier for the woman to accept. And even if she doesn't, the children will follow mo uh, the, the religion of the father. The father is the, the, the leader of the household. Therefore, the, okay. the children will, will follow his example. But if a woman is, if we now flip the roles now, and a woman is a Muslim and she's a non-Muslim man. For example, Muslims fast Ramadan. It's a whole month. Mm -hmm. And with it, with it, when you fast, you cannot have intercourse. Mm -hmm. Now, no, no, no non-Muslim man would want to wait one month while his wife, she wants to fast in a religion that he doesn't believe in. He will enforce his, also his, his own views on the children. He's the leader of the household. And mm -hmm. also he will influence her ideas and her, her understanding, which is very natural. So mm -hmm. uh, there, again, it all comes back to this idea. If you put it in your mind, look, men and women are not the same. Therefore, treatment with them has to be different. Then these ideas become much easier to understand when you look at the nature of a man and the nature of a woman. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I can mention a lot more stuff, but I wouldn't even like, for example, when it comes to, to intercourse and the things done in the intercourse, how the intercourse is done. There are many things that are prohibited from Islam perspective. The man would say, I don't care what your religion says. I want to do this. You know, I don't care your religion says this specific act cannot be done in this way. You know, he doesn't care. He wants to enjoy himself. This is his wife. So uh, it's very problematic, basically. Yeah. Okay. And I have one last question, and it's quite a specific question. Um, so the reason I have this question is because I recently gave birth, and I gave birth to a baby girl. And so my question is, do I have to shave off of, off her hair? And if I do, what is the logical reasoning behind this? No, you don't have to do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, this is like, uh, this, this is a sunnah. Like, it's a sunnah, which means it's a recommended act. Right? Oh, okay. So it's, it's recommended, but it's, it's not re like... It's but again, uh, yeah, yeah, it's recommended from Allah Azzawajal. It's not necessary for you to do. And okay. if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Like, it's not like, but it's it's an act of, of, of sunnah. But the thing is this. When you say, again, when you say, what is the logical reason behind this? There is an assumption. Mm -hmm. The assumption is, is that there has to be a logical justification that fits what you think is logical for every command in Islam. That's an assumption. Because otherwise, that question would not make any sense. Because if Allah commanded it and there is no need for me to have a logical justification, I'm not going to be asking for one. But there's an assumption for many people is that there has to be a logical explanation given to me that fits my understanding mm -hmm. uh, for every command in order for me to do that command. Then you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping your own desires, you're worshiping okay. your intellect. Do you understand? So if it makes sense to my intellect, I'm going to do it. If it does not make sense to my intellect, I'm not going to do it. And the fact is you can do this with any command in Islam. You can have a never ending process. For example, why is it five prayers? And if it was okay. six, you will say, why is it six prayers? If it's okay. 10, a person, another person will come and say, why is it 10 prayers? So there are certain things that we would call, there's two types of commands in Islam. Things which are ta'abudi means we do as an act of worship. For example, the one you mentioned about shaving the head. This is an act of worship. And then there is other things that Allah might tell you the reason and the wisdom behind them. There's two types of things. But the important thing, what you need to establish with logical uh, reasoning is whether Islam is the truth or not. Mm -hmm. Once you've established that with logical reasoning and evidences, then you cannot be questioning every single thing because you already now accepted this is literally God's command. You get the point? Once I establish this is from God, then I know God is speaking there. So if God is speaking there, I'm not going to be asking God every single thing. He said, tells me to do, why should I should do it or I shouldn't do it? The details are very specific things like what you mentioned about shaving the, uh, the head of a baby. Mm -hmm. So once you understand this concept, okay, I need first evidence that Islam is the truth. Okay, I've got evidence that Islam is the truth. I believe it's from God. Then mm -hmm. I would follow what God commands because he's God. He's the all-knowing, the all-wise. He is like the, the creator. He's the one who created me. And I'm in this life to obey and worship the creator. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you ask that question, you say, do I have to shave? Like, it seems like you're very close to Islam. So uh, or you want to accept Islam or something like that. Is that the case? Um, like I said, like I've, um, so basically for the last year and a half, I've been really looking into it, but it's just been taking me a while to like fully, um, accept everything that I've learned about it, which is why, um, I wanted to join your live and kind of ask some of those questions that I have hesitations with. Okay. Is there any other thing that you still have hesitation with, you know? Um, not that I can think of today. Okay. Okay, no problem. So um, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but ahead. thank you so much for answering everything. Yeah, no problem. I hope the, the answers were satisfactory, you know. And you're welcome to come uh, another time if you've got more questions about Islam. And I do. Like, we always welcome anyone to Islam, you know. If anytime you want to accept Islam, you want to become Muslim, you're welcome to come on. Uh, or you're welcome to speak to Muslims if you have Muslims around you who can help you do it. Uh, basically, we, we welcome everyone, you know. Everyone and anyone. Islam is a religion for everyone and anyone. And as I said, if you've got any questions, you're also welcome to come back, okay? Okay. Bye. No problem. Bye-bye.